Good afternoon. Hi, I'm Patrick, and uh, welcome to today's lecture. Um, to introduce our guest, Suzanne Lovell, uh, is our illustrious dean, Lou. Okay. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. And uh, it's been great working with all of you. I recognize many of you in the studio. And sometimes I, I go to your desk. I have, we have conversations. And then you ask people, who is this guy? Right? And <laughs> <laughs> but does someone care about you? And also, if you eat well, if you sleep well, if you work hard, you might get on my list. But also I have two lists. There's a good list and not so good list. So there's another list you don't want, want to get into. So I'm very excited today to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Suzanne Lovell. Welcome home. This you. is uh, Alma Mater. And you know uh, the word Alma Mater uh, is, uh, is, uh, is a Latin. It's not like I am an expert in language. I, just, I, I do some Googling. And uh, Alma Mater means nourishing, literally means nourishing mother. So this is a place we, I think, we nourish, we foster your intellectual and professional capacities. Welcome back. Welcome Thank home. You. And Thank you. <laughs> yeah, come on. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, uh, so uh, Suzanne was one of you sitting here uh, not long ago. Mm -hmm. She graduated from here with an architecture degree uh, not long ago. And uh, she, she is the founder and the CEO of a firm called Suzanne Lovell. And uh, it's in Chicago. Uh, is specialized in interior architecture, interior design, uh, and uh, and planning. Right? So it's fine art. And fine art. Fine art. Fine art. Fine art. And uh, sometimes I do and fine art. <laughs> and uh, so <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> and uh, so her firm is very successful over the years. Uh, her firm won a lot, a lot of national and international awards. I think just a little bit more than a year ago, uh, you guys won the, uh, the, uh, the best of the year award from Interior Design Magazine. So that's very, very impressive. So I, I had the honor to visit your firm uh, just a few months ago. I was very inspired and impressed. Uh, I think Suzanne's design are interwoven with art. And her arts are interwoven with stories. Uh, so I remember a, a, a very well-known German architect, okay, I from Latin to German now, uh, called Ole Schieren. You have no idea. <laughs> He's well-known, German architect. But I remember he said that uh, Architectures and buildings are spaces of stories, stories of people working and living there. I think yours are very good examples. So uh, when I visit Thank you, you. Uh, when I visit you, I also I follow some students and Professor Marcus Bryce Smith uh, to visit uh, the uh, the shore the apartment, shore lake lake shore apartment. And it was just fascinating to hear him talking about uh, the stories of the building and the design and the people. So Suzanne is also a lifetime learner. She's pursuing a PhD uh, in our college. And uh, is, is really excited uh, to see what he's, uh, uh, to, he's going to present. So join me in welcoming Suzanne Lovell. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm delighted to be in Blacksburg. I can't believe there are this many faces staring at me. I'm thrilled. This is great. Um, I want to interact just a bit before I go into my slideshow, and I want to tell you a couple of things. One, my, I have a lot of slides, so I'm going to go very fast. If I'm going too fast, somebody just tell me to slow down. But I'm going to talk fast, and they're going to go fast. That's one. Number two, um, you're all here in the college, in this university, and you have unbridled opportunity across disciplines. Discovering where you fit in that enormous canvas, canvas of disciplines is literally your job for the next five to 10 years. Um, and I wanna ask all of you to pull out a piece of, you know, 
take a look at this diagram, first of all. And it's talking about your in, your in school experiences in the middle, the outer world is outside that, and then in red are literally just a laundry list of opportunities of things you could be doing within the realm of architecture, interior design, fine art collections. Um, I want you all to take your phone out and write down your dream focus in architecture. What's your dream focus? If you were to put one word or three words or whatever, what would they be? Um, and the next five to 10 years again, they're pivotal. You must take the initiative and the responsibility to make them count. It's your career. I would have written, I would have written weaving because I have, was fascinated with the links of the grid that both weaving and architecture shared. So my word would have been weaving. Um, I understood weaving and I understood architecture in the same context. Whom do you want to know? Which architects fascinate you and why? Which engineers fascinate you and why? Who are the other engineers like her? How are the construction details actually going to look in the architecture you're imagining? Partner with a construction student and invigorate alternative ways for your ideas so your ideas can work. And I know this sounds simplistic, but I'm gonna back you up for a second and just tell you, I am trained as an architect. I consider myself an architect. I do interior architecture. No one seems to understand how valuable that is to interior design. Um, I'm happy to see the college doing what it's doing, um, but without interior architecture woven together with interior design, um, I think you have a hard time creating a platform that then you actually can put fine art into. So that's my, that's my lecture for the moment. Um, and in all honesty, uh, well, let me, let me start here. My background, even during school, was started in the big building architecture of SOM. I began when, it began when, I, as a fourth year student, I was in Chicago for a year doing an internship with SOM. And honestly, I was scared to death, death of the big city. SOM was hardcore boot camp. You want one of those. You want a hardcore boot camp. No more dreaming, just production. Taught rigorous drawing, presentation skills, model making, and selling. I was recruited from the original team of architects and engineers exploring the mighty computer for SOM in the 80s. During my six years at SOM, I was exposed to multi-use buildings, parking garages, toilet rooms, retail, office, residential. I was in the two and three bedroom apartment layouts of a development in Boston when I realized I had something to contribute. I discovered residential interior architecture. I knew something intuitively about the function and the feel of designing residential living. So now I'm going to share with you, um, I might, I'm going to share with you what I mean by that statement. These are some of the most recent residences I've created as an office of 16. We have 16 people in the office. We only do residential work. We do architecture, we do interior architecture, we do interior design and fine art collections. New construction, renovations, adaptive reuse, penthouses and high rises. And we work all over the country, even abroad, with teams of landscape architects, architects of record, technical architects, landscape architects, engineers, lighting consultants, and every magical contractor. Have you, here you see um, through the doorway, you see an insert of contemporary millwork. Um, I was gonna use them, but you can probably see it. Uh, an insert of contemporary millwork within an enormous Tudor summer house. This is what I drove up to for my interview. This was the interior condition with which I was faced. How would I bring a modernized vision to this residence, all the while respecting the his historical significance of the existing architecture? Often it is with a very simple approach to interior architectural finishes. Here my guiding imagery of vision was white plaster, industrial doors and windows that could share the incredible grounds and black stone floors. Arches were my tool to open up the rat warren of tiny rooms. So those images came out at every meeting with the client and we repetitively went through the interior architecture until it was time to start layering on um, 
other pieces and parts. And I always pulled her back to the very consistent interior architectural palette. We enclosed the three arches of the front porch, creating a new and larger sequence of entry. We exposed the wood and iron cased beams. Arches opened up the interior and created new vistas throughout the public spaces. Modern oak paneling extended the reference to historical paneling through the entire kitchen and breakfast area. We now had a much more gracious entry without disrespecting the existing Tudor architecture, a gracious entry foyer that, cre that greeted you. you didn't, it didn't tell the whole story yet. The art collection was important and it need to, needed to be exposed thoughtfully and slowly. The grounds were spectacular and also needed to be exposed slowly. Living room with Kara Walker on the left wall, the original fireplace, top hat, and mid-century modern furnishings. An eclectic collector was the client and she had a magical home with an even more magical garden that had been evolving for decades. Removing the old dark stain to expose the beautiful white oak paneling, certainly a labor of love, brightened the entire home and gave us the direction to keep clear white oak in our ever so simple interior architectural palette. A much more whimsical residence on the ocean in Florida, Rogan Gregory makes these incredible plaster lamps. Pierre Yanovich makes furniture pieces, a Stugavier drapery throughout the 15,000 square foot space and a 900 pound hand woven rug from made in Nepal, Nepal. Templates helped even us to understand the scale of this enormous property. How were we to make it feel warm, residential and inviting? How to create a home, not to mention where is the architectural grid? I swear I, I swore I would never work in an amoeba shaped building again. Lo and behold, of course, we were asked to design another penthouse in the same building. Um, but this is what we, this is what it looked like before we gutted the apartment. And now you see the 900 pound amorphic rug. Notice the black window frames. I often recommend this to my clients so that at night, the black sky blends together with the muttons or the, or the window frames effectively fall out into the night sky. Interior architectural materials are the key to driving an interior. You've heard me say that a few times already. These interior architectural materials serve as support and a guide to, all, to the addition of all the softer goods that design a residence. These two components woven together seamlessly create an architectural language. The design is integrated, not placed. There is a big difference. I'm weaving after all. Here, the carpet being hand woven in Nepal, our sofa designs being built, in built to specification in a New York workroom. Charles Jouf was someone I met in Paris and brought to Chicago to do perfect drapery details in a penthouse. He then opened a workroom in Manhattan and we've worked with him ever since. These are the relationships you must develop, or maybe you love building furniture, or maybe you love weaving and textiles. All of it is architecture. Here's a banquette in leather what a different work, with a different workroom installed at the card room and above panels are inlaid with handwoven leather you see at the left by Toyin Sellers also out of Paris. Handwoven leather. Architectural design and art are all about relationships. In all honesty, I could have been very happy as a hand weaver. My career had choices along the way and so does yours. You must be listening and guiding your career. You are not shoehorned into corporate architecture only. You can dream, take a look at the word you wrote at the beginning of this talk. This is the current foyer of the penthouse recently completed. Uh, the, the client and I have decided to make this area a bit more dramatic where we will paint all of the millwork in a high sheen black lacquer like the card room which is miles away in the penthouse. And again, hand-woven leather panels in blue that this time will be inserted to reflect the ocean view one enters upon from the large elevator foyer, floor included. I just wanna bring, bring a comment to this. You know, you, you can always extend the palette, that architectural interior palette, 
but to stray from it puts you in a position where you start to lose your message. So that's, that's me ad-libbing for a second. Here you see me standing with a template. We had plotted uh, to scale of 10 foot by 16 foot walnut hand carved commission by Caleb Woodard, carved on both the inside and the outside faces of the door to the, master, to the media room at the center of the penthouse. And Caleb's daughter for scale. My world is about relationships and creating opportunities with the likes of the Caleb Woodards, a wonderful, talented work woodworker indeed. Dynamic energy and artworks were essential to this client. They had no art and wanted an education in blue chip fine artworks. That began about three years ago. And I'm very proud to say we just last month purchased a very important du buffet and hung it in the apartment, in the penthouse. Color and complexity was the order of the day. Notice that the drapery is consistent all the way around the public areas of the plan. This connecting tool of consistency creates the envelope of understanding of home. Architecture can be extended into the soft goods of your creations. I consider window coverings as architecture. The black window frames at night. And speaking of the power of artwork, Black Kate creates the stunning entry to this Manhattan St. Regis residence we brought together, in which we brought together seven units. We had previously put together these two, this two room suite for the same client. She and her new husband then wanted seven more units brought together. Here you see a stunning Kara Walker painted on a masonite panel. It came up the fire stair in the night and made it over the banister by three quarters of an inch. An Eglemise on glass as the view there was no view, literally a landscape drawn with a Sharpie on the back of glass with a blue wash. Again, respectful of the existing Beaux-Arts architecture of the St. Regis. These are the 70 units as we combined them facing Madison Avenue in Manhattan. We were inspired by this painting. We hand scraped and sculpted the walnut parquet floors, a control sample at the right. I accept nothing without a control sample. And I think this is a, a point where I just wanna say everything you see in all of these pictures, we did everything. We did all of the, all of these things were gutted. We redid the plaster, we redid, like we did everything, all of the architecture, all of the interior architecture and all of the fine art collections. Baccarat chandeliers were requested as, an original, as in the original suites, a map of her favorite city for fashion, Milan as a silk carpet a daughter's room with the Land of Oz map as the silk carpet, and of course, glass balloons as the chandelier. You might say, and in my practice-based PhD, I've been forced to get comfortable with this. You might say all of these extravagances can be disgusting at a certain point. I had to def defend that in my practice-based PhD, and I'm still defending that area of my practice. I consider my job as a professional is to give the client the very best professional support of their dreams. It is not about me. It is sifted through my professional 3D grid of understanding, but in the end, they will live there. We could speak here for the entire class about Marcus Breischmidt and non-referential architecture. Architecture is a business partnership that develops around trust. I've cre created several residences for many of my clients because of that trust. Reflection is a powerful tool, this being a room and mirror, which was part of a pair in the entry foyer. And now for a modern take on a cabin in the woods. We tore down the small cabin that this client had vacationed in for years and were charged with building the large version of the so-called lake cabin. One of our only from the ground up residences we have designed. This was a labor of love indeed, elevations, construction, material palettes, meticulous weave of architectural material palette with the soft goods of design. <laughs> Art and sculpture create an interior of interest and humor. I literally broke the tree mushroom off a tree on the land and had sconces molded for the stair hall. We have nothing without imagination. An entry foyer chandelier, the light, the play of light is spectacular 
And here is a rendering of the Polynesian residence we have designed for this same client on the beach on, Cap in the, on, the beach on Captiva Island. The shovel goes in the ground next month. Material palettes are my design field. They create languages of interior architecture. Organization and the filling of these residences requires thousands of purchase orders and purchasing and procurement is a business in and of itself. Hilton Head Island, a second home for, a high, for an Irish couple. This is what it looked like. This is where we took it. With this client's first home, we had traveled to Ireland to visit a very talented woodworker named Joseph Walsh. After our visit, we commissioned a dining table and chairs. This is his grandfather's original farmhouse and fireplace, as well as a new studio being built on the left in Cork, Ireland. For the house in Hilton Head, we commissioned a cabinet from Joseph. Here you see it installed. And on to the next. This was a meticulous re renovation of an original full floor unit of a Howard Von Duren Shaw uh, building dating 1923. The original details were literally flaw flawlessly restored or meticulously recreated. Here an ebony room modernized the historic details. Hardware and millwork details abounded. The entry foyer plaster work was completely reworked to mimic the original, but allow for full HVAC integration. The entry gallery floor was selected from four fully plotted in color paper mock-ups. Again, building trust with a team. HVAC manipulated together. Plaster work meticulously crafted. Back to the amoeba shaped building, just a different penthouse for a different client. A totally different take on home, much more formal, more immersed in a large commission. Here we're immersed in a large commission. David Weissman made a bronze, porcelain, and Czechoslovakian glass sculpture to light the bar and integrate a lone column. The enormous 15,000 square feet again. A chair is a speck in the plan view. A bamboo-inspired spa space with real bamboo outside. An enormous amount of mosaic crafted in Canada. The result? The workshop of David Weissman, that's my drawing at the top of imagination of how we would do a, a bar and connect to the column. David, of course, with his pieces and parts, made the commission magical. And the full view of his creation, again, the word is partnership. Partnership with other craftspeople, dream, and then figure out how to create. Here, I want you to think hard about millwork as a trade as a craft, eglamaze on glass or black or back painted glass on the left. And on the right, imagine the construction of what you see, stone, glass, mirror, bronze, and of course there's wood behind there. How does that get put together? Who is the brain power behind that? Honestly, this is the magic. And honestly, here are many more slides. I will click through the transformations, many different craftspeople have made it happen. So I'm at 20 minutes and I have a uh, uh, hundred more slides. So I'm going to go fast. Um, so anyway, craftsmanship. This is an indus industry of partnership. Partnership is the magic of creative genius. Click the, um, here you see me outside. This is a residence we're on our second renovation of. We renovated it 20 years ago, then we did it again. When the client called, I asked him, can I take out the powder room? I took out the powder room. We ended up with a breakfast room that was filled with light and filled the foyer with light as well. This is a golf cottage, tiny little thing. Um, here I extended the small golf cottage by adding a separate room an outside room of garden. The views was no longer just out to the banyan tree and golf course. It now had a quiet and tranquil side yard to enjoy. This is the construction of the 
if you look carefully, it's a kitchen that completely disappears. And that's what it looks like when it's closed. Another residence where we're building gates, pairs and sets of gates along with the renovation of the apartment, but it's the craftsmanship, the genius of so many craftsmen we have the honor of working with who teach us the how of perfection. This is a good story. So this is a residence collection of um, vessels. I designed the furniture with Frank Pilaro, made all the furniture for the residence. And part of our charge was to house these beautiful vessels. So we went to a great extent to do this bronze cabinet with goatskin and uh, HVAC to keep the pots cool and lighting to light up the pots and da 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 da. All this coordination that happened. And if you notice this vessel next to the blanket, 800 years old. Disaster. Location built just for this 800 year old vessel. The panel behind the vessel had been attached by the mill worker with Velcro. The refrigerator door slammed behind it one too many times. Luckily, I was not the millwork specifier. Can we make a tray at least, is what I said to the, to the client. And, and then we went to an archeologist and asked if he could put it together and make a tray. And he said, can I, can I do it in the round? Do you know I'm an archeologist? Like, can I do it in the round? For real, Kintsugi, which we now, you know, we know this as the method of ceramic repair, Japanese method of ceramic repair. And I think the vessel itself is even more interesting now than it was before. And the client feels the same, same way. So it's very, it was a very good result. Um, and this is a residence down in Miami, moving millwork wall. We're putting together five units and now I don't know, two more. And we're doing the um, view from the ocean to the bay, the full view. This is actually an interesting project. This was um, Linda Johnson Rice of Johnson Publishing came to me and asked me if I would um, design her interior as if I were Arthur Elrod and I was doing the apartment for 2022 instead of 1972, 62, sorry. This was in Architectural Digest in 1962. And we, our charge was to renovate it. So it still felt like Arthur Elrod had done the renovation. Um, it, was a, it was a nice challenge, it really was. It's a fun challenge. Here we were asked to do a car condo. They were gonna have one image on the wall. And I said, why stop at one? Let's just do the whole place. So we did the whole place in a mural, um, simulators, etc. The variety of what we get to touch is, it's really fun. <laughs> and then here, one last, uh, no, it's not the last residence, but this one is interesting because our craft is magical, especially if you are true to yourself and you create from a platform of knowing, knowing yourself, your talent, staying with it and sharing it generously. Solution driven. The lady didn't want wood floors, they'd get scratched. What was she gonna do? She lived on the beach. I said, well, we'll, get, we'll do terrazzo and you can have a buffer in the back room. And so we went to the guys that did the Miami airport and we did a carpet, a complete carpet of terrazzo throughout the residence. Um, and there's not a rug to be found. Okay, this is, can you see that? Oh, wait a minute, what are you looking at? Hmm. Wait a second. That's not what you should be seeing. There you go, okay. So this is, a, this, is, this is really the last residence I'm gonna talk about and I wanna talk briefly because um, there's a logical sequence was the operative word for this client, a logical sequence. So he lives in number one, number two is his pool house, number three is his shed, where he has his entertaining done in number four. 
we're charged with building number five. Um, and it's a sequence in the landscape that you see under construction. That's under construction right now. Um, and it's also a sequence in fine art works. He has a marvelous collection of blue chip art. And in the same way that he talked about his land, I started talking about his artwork and the dialogue that he would have inside his architecture. Um, the elevations helped to set ceiling heights and they helped us to group certain messages together. So I'm, I'm switching now to fine art and why fine art has such an important messaging system inside our interior architecture. Um, the dialogue you create is a story and talking about stories is what you started off with. Um, my goal with every client is to give them a story. Uh, I have the professional grid, three-dimensional grid. They have their own grid. And it, if you can weave them together, it's magical. Masterworks that created a di dialogue of messaging for the collector. These are renderings out of China. The furniture is all in white because we were talking about the architectural palette, not the furniture. The client needed to focus on the architectural palette and understand that this space was gonna be warm and the exterior stone was not gonna make it cold even though it came inside. Um, renderings with white furniture was merely a placeholder of space, not a design decision. This is uh, the master bath uh, rendering it sent me over to Italy to buy a block of onyx. It's being book matched as we speak in the residence. This is a mock-up of a plenza, uh, 3D printed at the site to help understand scale. These are the kinds of things we do for our clients. And this is a simple concept. Um, on the 91st floor, at the top of the world, this was the material palette that was the inspiration and, and um, beginning of the project for the client. This is us selling inside the space. We sell each day. Notice the black window wall again. Drama of the skyscraper. And with that said, the developer of this building called me in a panic. He had 11 floors of penthouses for sale at the top. And the architect had not thought about what happens when the building decreases around the core. The floor plate compresses, but no thought was given to the interior plan. A wake up call indeed. You have a core building. You have a three foot hallway. What happens when you don't have the room for the three foot hallway? How do you get around? So we designed 11, 11 apartment plans for penthouses and then we shared Im imagery for interior architecture as well. Fine artworks play a pivotal role in the expression of an, ex of an interior. It's truly not about the chair. Thank you. <laughs> and I just wanna read this quote real quickly and then I'm all questions, because I did it in 33 minutes, that's good. The more genuine the involvement, the more sincere and sustained the participation in analyzing and solving problems. The greater the release of everyone's creativity and of their commitment to what they create. Thank you, really. Thanks. Questions? Questions? Do we have questions? How did you start out on your own? Oh, ooh, yeah, ooh. Um, I thought I was gonna be a developer and I thought that I was gonna develop um, multi-residence multi buildings. I was gonna do adaptive reuse of older buildings and make them apartments and I was gonna develop. And I did my first project for a man who owned the Turtle Wax building in Chicago. And I planned out all these wonderful, wonderful residences. And I realized, ooh, now I have to construct all that. 
and pay for all that. And, mm. and I also was brought up by a mother who was, um, my mother was an, um, a, a docent, but a, a long time docent at Winniture Museum. So the largest collection of American antiques. So I knew a lot inherently from my own upbringing about interiors and I wanted to do residential work. I wanted to do residential interior architecture. And so I started calling myself a decorator. And I started out that way as a decorator. I mean, decorate your house. <laughs> because that's what the people understood. And it was okay. I knew that I could get to a place where I could do interior architecture the way I wanted to. And I would introduce myself as, as I'm, I'm trained as an architect, but I do interiors. It was frustrating for a long time, but it came around. And then I would say that uh, as I started to feel confident that the interior architecture was holding together through architectural material palettes, that was the magic of our interiors for sure. As I started to get comfortable with that, then I realized I couldn't take photographs because nothing was on the wall. Well, that doesn't work. You do all this work and then the money shot, there are six money shots in a, re in a residence. When you walk in, you're gonna look at a piece at a wall, at a piece of, of art. And I had a fine art research lady in my office and she and I just started a dialogue and we started going to all these art fairs and really collecting artists that we like. And she was always raising the bar to blue chip art and it turned into a very strong part of our business because we were holding together architecture and we were giving a story through the collection of the art that they were putting in it or even the design that they were putting in it because you know some of the craft that's out there is artists doing additions and you know and i realized we could commission artists and you know it just it just evolved and now I would tell you, there are two things that are important about my work. Two things I worry about. Architectural material palette staying, can't staying consistent in whatever the original concept was. And the second thing, and I'm just gonna go back to this image. That, that's a material palette. That's everything about the apartment. You don't need to know anything else. That is the apartment. And the second thing I would say is most important is getting that dialogue of the art to happen and actually giving, giving the client an understanding of why that dialogue works. I wonder if I can go back here for a second. Let's see. This, uh, these renderings were really, really valuable to me because I could see the power of his cat's collection. And then he had a very large collection of things that were um, really expressing genocide. And this is William Kentridge. And, and so we grouped the messages together in the different pods of the residence. So I'm still learning. And, and honestly, you guys, the, the, the only reason I can even talk partially about what I'm doing is because of the practice-based PhD and their request of me to, what did you do? How did you do it? Why did you do it? How? Um, and that constant effort to come up with an answer to that. And when non-referential architecture came across my desk, um, uh, I went head over heels because it was talking about the room. And I'm going to, you're going to laugh because I'm going to pull the book out of my bag. Right here. Not a this. It was talking about the room and the room being the beginning of architecture. That resonated with me because I'm trying to do your room, not my room. My reference is really you and that room, and that room, how do I build big residences, lots of room, and still have a message that comes from non-referential architecture. It's not Institute of Classical Architecture. It's not a set of rules. It's not, 
it's a material palette that is going to make you happy. And that's, yeah. <laughs> Catherine, you need to ask a question now. Oh, I might be able to show you the vitrines. Uh, okay, so um, they, the, the, the practice-based PhD, the, the only reason I can, I can talk a little bit right now is because of the practice-based PhD, because I've found some grounding in what, what is it that I hold on to in these residences. And um, the architectural material palette was obviously my anchor, um, and then how does, does one talk about the magic that you bring to that vision, and what is my magic? And if, you were to, if I were to make a diagram or show you a diagram, I think the one that I liked the most inside the practice-based PhD was I had a grid, a 3D grid of a building, just a 3D grid wireframe of a building. That was me. That's me, that's my experience, that's my work, that's my training, that's everything. And then, oh, you, the client, you have a 3D grid of you. And how do I take what you need from mine and what I need from yours and bring them together to create something that means something to you? I don't li I'm not going to live in the house. It, it needs to mean something to someone else. So when... They talk, he talked about non-referential architecture. I think I do non-referential architecture all the time because I'm doing architecture for a different personality. I'm not trying to tell you that I'm the greatest architect in the whole wide world. You know, it's, all my buildings have to be like this. You know, it's just not, it wasn't interesting to me. Um, what was interesting to me was the personalities and the people. And then I went, um, for, I was pushed further back to, okay, what is it? And Gaston Bacalard, I've read every one of his books ever written, printed, blah, blah, blah. Um, he was writing in the 30s about the reverie of poetry. And he was talking about words and how words have meaning and that, you know, that can create a feeling and a place. And... Um, my practice-based PhD is going to attempt to say that where he said images didn't count, I'm saying images do count because the image of the palette actually counts. And the image of the palette then woven with the goods makes a home. And we always talk about the personality of our client in, our, in the office. We talk about the personality of the client and trying to get that to look like the client, be like, the, well, she dresses like this, she's gonna like that. And then I put, uh, started making some boxes for my exhibition for my practice-based PhD, and those boxes were just material that I was grabbing from all sorts of drawers and places all over the office, and I was placing them on a table and arranging them like we do when we sell an interior. But they were just objects or pieces of horsehair or whatever they were. And I realized I was making vitrines of a personality. I wasn't making, this is exactly what I do. You know, so I made four vitrines. Each one is very different than the other. And I did it kind of secretly from the office. They didn't know I was doing it. And then I put them out for the office. And I said, so, so what do you think? Who, who lives in this house? And I pointed to the vitrine. And it was really interesting to feel the reality of expression of a type of individual through these things that you put together. And, you know, then you can get upset and say, well, it's too flamboyant or whatever. But that's another part of my PhD that I have to iron.
it'll be a few more years. A couple more years, too. <laughs> Uh-huh. And I'm always faced with the same indecisiveness of how do I want to treat my kid? And especially with each kid, there is you know, some teacher groups that are inspiring and that we have to talk about how much it likes or some people don't like certain teacher groups, but uh, I don't want to get into it. Mm-hmm. Maybe the next year. And I always just end up now going to each generation and I'm saying, and how do I know like, if you have the freedom of deciding now what you want to do? For me, it would, uh, I'll, I'll answer in two ways. One, I've tried to live in Philip Johnson's glass house my whole career. I've tried. I keep trying and trying and trying, and I can't do it because I really enjoy the sentimental and the, the sentimental stories, and I also really enjoy the art dialogue. The art dialogue for me is everything of, in, a, in a residence. So if you were to take what you said, well, I like the really simple and I like this other thing. Build out those houses in your mind and put artwork in them. And you'll see how similar they are. And you'll start to see that it doesn't matter so much. Because your dialogue, your story might be more in the art. That didn't answer your question, but maybe just try them all on. Um, well, we're constantly going to, it, probably the best answer is we're constantly going to art shows, Art Basel, Venice Biennale, Art Basel in Miami. You know, we're all, always being presented with a lot of work from galleries now that they know that we're, you know, we have people who are buying art. Um, the industry's changed a lot. It used to be just a gallery was about sculpture and painting, sculpture or painting. Now, the whole business of a, the art world has gone to editions of design, editions of bronze vessels, editions of bronze chairs, Ingrid Donat. You know, there's some classic uh, carpenters' workshop. They're, they're classic galleries that work in a lot of these craftspeople's work. And it's just looking all the time. And I think the other thing that's been um, pivotal is that because of the size of the residences we're doing, we can commission sometimes a thing like David Weissman's chandelier, um, which you know, it takes a while to get to that place. Um, but they become your friends because you're creating with them, right? We were, we, we created it together. We made a mock-up. I came, we walked under it. Unfortunately, I took the client to that one and I wanted a white, all white porcelain to be in this thing because it was, and she wanted every color of pink she could have. So we have pink and red. Yeah, yeah. At a certain point, you let some of those things go. Um, Catherine, did I answer your question? Yeah? Because the practice-based PhD, D, you guys, is the greatest gift that, that the university ever gave me. It really is. Because I've learned to talk differently about what I do. And I don't apologize anymore for saying I called myself a decorator. You know, it just... It's part of how I got there. And in, I think it has made me believe that interior architecture, interior design really needs architecture to, to carry it. Anyway, any more questions?
yellow. Uh-huh. Um, we started actually with photography and uh, we do a lot of research. So tons of research happens in our office and uh, we do lots of collections of things just on our own. Oh, I like this with that. Oh, I like that with that. Oh, that's, look at what this does for that. So we're looking at art. There's, Kelsey would tell you there's art out all the time. Um, but we started small and built our way up um, to blue chip artworks. And if you, if the client's hungry, they want the education. And you, then you have to go do it. You have to go, you have to take them, educate them. And, you know, it's not, it's not a shoe in. I can tell you that. <laughs> it's not. So does that answer your question? Ish? That's right. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I have two answers. Shoot. Um, I continue to develop, develop the art part by the massive amounts of research that and, the, and I look at art all the time. I mean, I must spend four hours of my day looking at artworks by different people. And, for the, and what I would say to you, otherwise, as far as the trust is concerned, we have a very rigorous business. We have rigorous methods and process. And our clients learn that, that's a, that it's a process that's safe and it's going to be consistent and, oh, they're going to do that again. Like you have to understand, I take that concept of um, interior ma architectural materials that gets laid out every time that client comes in, it's laid out. We start at the front door. We talk about the house from the front door, public space, the same way every time. And I think the consistency of that expression plus the consistency of the business expression garners trust. It's why they come back and say, okay, I know what to expect now. I know, I know she's expensive, but I know that it'll get done and it'll be right. It'll be good. You know, there's, um, and they also know that I'm very, I wear my heart on my sleeve. I'm very honest with my clients. Like, I think that's a terrible idea, I, you know, but I don't say it that way, but I'm not afraid to say, I don't think that works. Um, or I'm not afraid to say why I think what I'm suggesting works. Um, trust. Big, it's a big deal. Yeah? Who has access to fine art? Who has access to fine art? You mean in my office or in general? Oh, I don't think it's a societal barrier. Pers personally, I don't think so. I think one can educate themselves on art very easily. You just have to do the work and you have to build the understanding of why what art is better than another piece of art. And you have to learn to talk about it and you have to learn to talk about it in front of other people. And you just have to develop your own your own uh, messaging system because part of it is a matter of looking at one artist's work and understanding what of that work is good and what's not so good. Because as a curator for people's collections, you have to say, you know, you, I don't think we should buy that piece that's in the Sotheby's catalog. And, and people can get 
upset that they can't buy blue chip fine art. Well, there's all sorts of art that you can shepherd. And, you know, I mean, I had to start somewhere. Works on paper. You know, you just have to, I think artists have to do that too. I think artists also need to understand that they have to know the art world, know why they think their art's good, know what their art is relative to, what other work is, is it relative to. There was a woman who I saw um, this morning who had done a, a painting and it was clearly a reference to 18th, 17th century um, biblical paintings. And when I said it to her, she was really like surprised. Wow, yeah, it is. I said, yes, you've, draw you've painted the lifting of the light. It's light. Anyway, you know, it's training yourself and teaching yourself to read. I also um, have a, I, I turn pieces of art upside down and I look at them and if they don't work upside down, I don't think they work at all. <laughs> That's my bias. Anybody else? Architectural details. Because abstract to me was that image I had up on the up on the screen that was um, that was uh, the material palette. Whoa, this one. So now you have to take that that is abstract and create the details that tell you the proportion of that concept. So what's the proportion of those materials in that residence? And how are they running? Are they horizontal or are they vertical? Which piece is what? I made the black the floor because I wanted the floor to fall down. It's up in the sky. Um, how do you make it concrete? Really, literally with your architectural details and your elevations of Okay, how am I using this? Ooh, that's way too much stone. Ooh, that's too much wood. Everything's wood. You know, where's the plaster? Um, but I do, I think it's an interesting question because when you put together a material palette, it has proportion and scale. And it's, it's sometimes very disturbing when you know that your little paint chip is actually a huge piece of the room. So how do you represent that? So we get a big sample made. <laughs> Needs to be a big sample. Um, yeah. Control samples. Yes? I try, I try really hard to listen, which I'm not that good at, but I try really hard. And then I would say to you, I work on it morning, noon, and night, trying to figure out how I'm going to respond until I can come up with the real answer of, you know, sometimes it comes quickly, but other times it, it doesn't. And you just have to work at, okay, how am I going to tell him that that's a really bad idea? Uh, and it has to be something else's fault because you have, La 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 and la 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 and la la la. This is one item too many, or there's going to be too much uh, too much glass, and it's the acoustics are going to be terrible if we do the stone floor with all that. Like you know, you have to rationalize it for them and get them to. I'm not a good debater, <laughs> but I uh, you have to rationalize with them. Does that answer your question? Um, I've never
never really encountered it, honestly, because I think I'm building a story. I'm going to go back to the story word in a different way. I've been building a story with them from the very beginning. So they're on my, they're on my highway, you know, they're already on the penguin highway and they're plodding along. And so I'm setting myself up so I can rationalize with them if they make a wrong turn. Right. And for instance, the lady with the white plaster and the, and the big arches, you know, she wanted to put red. I don't know. There was something red that was going to go. And I was like, are you kidding me? Do you remember our palette? And I said, but Nina, the palette, look at the palette. And I literally sent her an email with the original palette. And she said, oh, I knew you were going to say that. And you were going to be right. You know, like, yeah, over there. Yeah. Uh, 10 years ago, I would have told you 12 to 18 months. Um, now I would tell you 18 to 36 months. Yeah. They're bigger and longer and yeah. Anybody else? Thank you.